model-wise, we got to this point. We put a concrete floor. We did two levels of steel. Um, I wanted to maybe just quick review. We'll go ahead and put one more level of roof on this thing in steel, I guess. So we'll go back to our plan button on the fourth floor, maybe. So, to copy up another level, one of the things with to the floor, we've got these joists spaced out at 12 foot, six inches apart, because we're 25 foot bay. That's a little far for a roof deck to go. So we're gonna wanna change the spacing on our joists, and we're gonna wanna change our design loads to a roof load instead of a floor load. So let's go to layout. Type, select, and now we'll put in a new layout type roof and add it. And we'll select it. And we have nothing there, so we'll go back to layout type and we'll go to copy this time. So if you want to copy what's down below. And we'll copy the steel floor. Uh, we'll do grid lines, beams and joists, columns, we don't have any walls, uh, decking, let's not do decking, and we won't do roads. Okay, so, kind of got everything, we want to delete all these beams that are 12 foot on 12 foot 6 on center. So we'll go to beam up here, or you can go to layout, beams, delete, and we can hit intersect line, and we just draw a line down between the ones we want to delete. So click, pull it down, click again. And it gets rid of all of these. Okay, so now we want to put in Joyce. Uh, well, we're 25 feet, so a third of that, about eight foot. Four inches. That'll give us 25 foot module on it. So we'll go up to beams again. And it was already on. And we'll add this. And let's see. What's the beam space I need? So eight feet is what, uh, 96 inches and four, so 100 inches on center. So I've changed units down to inches and 100. And we'll put Space to eight foot four on center, which is a nice number for uh, inch and a half metal deck. That's what she uses on a roof. And the reason we go inch and a half metal deck is uh, because it gives you it's. It's shorter, so it's stiffer. and it gives you better diaphragm values than the three inch deck. And we're not gonna put any concrete fill on it. So uh, the inch and a half deck is kind of the go-to deck for roofs where there's no concrete fill on it. All right, 
So we got beams, and since these are steel beams, the program will design them, design them for us. All right, we need a slab edge because we didn't copy that up. So we go again, layout, slab, slab edge. And if we use our same 12 inches, kind of a standard uh, full perimeter, and it sticks it in there automatically as long as you have beams all the way around the perimeter. All right, we need a deck on here. So we'll go back to our decking. And this time we want a non-composite uh, deck. So we're going to click on non-composite. We'll call it a roof deck. Self-weight, we're not worried about that. And really, we don't need any of this other stuff. Deck of thickness, we're not going to use it for the diaphragm. We'll just add it and hit OK. And then we'll lay out, slab, deck assign. And again, we'll go the short direction, so up and down. One way deck, up and down. Uh, let's see, we want non composite. There's our roof deck that we just identified. And we'll put it on the whole floor. And again, you can, if you can kind of see these purple lines, they go up and down indicating the deck directions. All right, uh, loads, we need a roof load. So we don't have a roof load defined yet, so let's add one. And bed load, I don't know, 20 pounds a square foot. And the Dex 3, the the stuff they put over the top to make it flat is about two and a half, three, that's six. Roofing is going to be a couple to four, that's ten. Ceiling at five and miscellaneous at five, 20 pounds. Uh, since we're non-composite, it doesn't matter what the construction <coughs> load is because we don't have to worry about that. Live load is a roof load, so we can just click on the roof button and 20 pounds is typical roof load. Um, the reason it has a roof button there is because the reduction factor is different for the floors. Uh, there's no partition load, no construction, but we need to get our mass load to 20. Hit add. Uh, okay. And then we'll put it on the roof. Loads, surface loads. Highlight roof, add it to the whole floor, and there it is. The other thing we're going to have for perimeter walls, we're going to have some weights <coughs> tripping up to the roof, so we want to model in a, a line load to represent half the wall down below. I think we had a line load. We had an exterior wall of 300 pounds a foot, and that was for a typical floor, which you have half up and half down, right? So you have a floor with 14 feet or something, or 13 foot or foot. So that's for a full 13 foot high wall, with the roof only going halfway down, so six and a half feet or something. So it's probably gonna be half of this 300 pounds. So <coughs> let's create a call it a roof wall load and we'll put it in a half of 300 pounds so 150 pounds lineal foot line load will be 150 again this is in kips per foot there's no live load on the wall and that's really it so we'll add that to our property table and then we'll lay out loads, line loads around the perimeter, roof wall, and we have a whole perimeter button, which is really nice. So click that, and it sticks it all the way around your perimeter. 
See, it's not in here, so what did I forget to do? Just because I have a typical floor layout doesn't mean it's in the model yet. We have to put it in the story data. So let's get out of the <coughs> viewer by hitting this X. Go to story data up here. And I've got a second, third, and fourth floor. I need to now put in a roof. Uh, and we want the floor type to be the roof type. We'll click there. Let's see, we're about we're about what three levels at fourteen feet. What's the difference between the typical and the steel floor? The typical floor was a concrete floor. Got it. We could change that thing to be a little more descriptive if we want it. So we got the roof. We're going to put it in at, uh, get back to inches. Do that in here. Yeah. So we'll go 168 inches again. Get the same height. And so that's what, 14? about 14 feet, isn't it? So column, you generally don't splice it till about, you know, shipping is about 40 feet. Um, so we got 15, we got 45 feet. I'd say we're gonna have to splice this. Well, it's, the ground level is concrete, so we only have three levels at 15 feet. They could probably ship that without too much trouble, so. We'll say no splice level here. And we'll go ahead and add it. So now we have a roof and we'll hit OK. Now if we do our 3D view, we should see this roof up here. There we go, second, third roof. We can get rid of the deck. Let's spin it around and look at it here. So kind of a quick review there. Questions or? All right. All right, so we'll go back. Let's double check our data here. No errors or warning, we're looking good. Save it away. Again, in order to mass out your building, especially with the steel, you got to design it. So we'll go down to the beam design module, the next button down, and we'll hit the design all. Hit the button, and we're done. Just that fast. So let's. <laughs> Last time we looked at the steel floor, and this button here is a uh, few sizes right here. And we can increase the size. So, this is what we saw last time, right? 1631, so on the floors, 2144 girders. So, let's see what the roof looks like. Notice we've got studs called out 16 on the beams and 16 on the girders. Let's go look at the roof. Okay, so you notice there's no stud call outs, but we got a 12 by 16 now, and 16 by 26 uh, girders. And three quarters inch camber, that's not too bad. There's no camber on the girders. 
Now, just a couple design notes. When you have these small beams out here, 12 by 14, has a little four inch wide flange. You're gonna be supporting this perimeter wall somehow off of this beam. So it makes it a little hard to grab onto a four inch flange, number one. And number two, you got an inch and a half camber out here. So you know, you're, you're grabbing onto this wall with an inch and a half camber. So a lot of times I don't like to have that much camber on the perimeter. And I like to have a little wider flange. Uh, so if you're familiar with the steel book, a 1422 will have a five inch flange. It's a little bit bigger beam. So I kind of like that. Uh, so let's do a view update and see what happens if we change one of those perimeter beams to a 1422. So that VU button up there is a view update so we can view it and update it. So we'll just pick one of these perimeter guys. So you can see the demand capacity ratio is 0.84 for strength, 0.76 strong composite. So we can scroll down in this box here so we find a 1422, right there, and we can hit analyze, and deflection wise we're at 0 0.8, we have no camber this time, which is really nice for perimeter stud walls, the guys, contractors like you when you have no camber on the perimeter stud, so let's update the database here. And this will override the optimization, which is what we want. And now we have a 1422 without any camera. And then I would go around and, you know, do this one, this one, this one, all of them like that. And that, that's just a, I think it works out better. The detailing's a little easier. All right, so we got a building, we've got the gravity system. Let's. Get out of here, go to the column module. So you kind of walk down these buttons over here on the left. This is the column design module. I think I'll go back to the beam design module. See this yellow light right there? What that means is that I have overridden something in the optimization. And it's, it's probably okay, but what it hasn't done is it hasn't updated the mass of that beam because I overrode it. So if we go back and hit, uh, back to the beam module, and we hit design all this DA button here, it's gonna go back through the design. And I think it's done already. Save it away. And I'll get out of this exit. And now you see that yellow button up there for ram steel beam is now green because it's accounted for the new weight of that 1422. Let's go to the column module. And we'll get rid of this button up here, gets rid of the deck. We can get rid of the gravity beams. So these are these blue ones. Get rid of the gravity beams. We don't care about those. But we do want to look at the columns. And then we can hit the design all the A button again. And it'll design all the columns in 10 seconds or less. Yeah. So you can kind of see there's no splices in the column, so the lowest level column is going to be almost highly spaced. And we've got yellow up here, which is what, 0 0.9 to 0.95. I don't see any orange ones, do you? Anybody? Okay, so that's a, for me, that's a nice comfortable place to be. They're stressed up, but they're not maxed out, so there's a little extra room in there. Uh, we can view update these and see what sizes they are. So 
I will pick one of these interior, they all going to be the same. <coughs> so there were three trial sizes over there on the right, at 1448, 1245, and at 1045. And it looks like the 1245s are the lightest for some reason. It's interesting, in 1045 you think it's the same weight, right? Well, it should be the same, so, some, so there's some round off. And so it selected the 1245s as the standard column. Here's the interaction equation, so we're at 0.92. And then if we view results, we can actually see it in printout. So 1.2 dead plus 1.6 root, looks like a good the design. It's the dead and the live load, these are the live load moments that I use for a particular load case. And down here at the bottom, kind of gives you all the different parameters. <coughs> it looks like there's, there's six pages. This particular one is the, this is the roof level. If we go down, one, there's the interaction equation for the roof level only design of about 0.2. So not highly stressed at the roof. <coughs> Here's level four. And about 0.6 for the interaction equation. Level three. Uh, we're going to be at 0.84, or 0 0.92 rather, that's the other equation, and that's it. So that's the first lift of this column. All right, so it looks like we're pretty happy with where we're at design-wise. So we'll go ahead and save this up here. All right, any questions before we go on to lateral design? This is kind of what we want to get to, right? <laughs> so let's we save this away and get out of here. We'll go down to this frame design, that's the lateral module. Hey Wes, I have a question. Yeah. What would the company you work for charge for you to do this, whatever, however how, with how far you are right now? How far? Yeah. They would charge uh, $150 an hour. So let's see, it's taken us, what? Well, I could do this in, a, in an hour. But. <laughs> it's taken the like two almost two and a half hours to do it in this class. <clears throat> so yeah. Oh yeah, our charge out rate for me is 150 bucks an hour. It's kind of low, isn't it? I thought you'd be more. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might want to go to work for. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Hazelton pays more. Depends on where you go to and work. Uh, you know, if you're working in Bay Area, their uh, fees are that's a charge out rate, okay? And generally, I mean, just to kind of a rule of thumb, it's it's about you know, if we're paying you fifty dollars an hour. In order to make money, you have to charge three times that rate yeah. as an hourly rate. So it's about two seventy-five to three dollars, three times. 
to get to cover overhead and profit and all that type of stuff. So I know last semester I had uh, one of the steel design projects and if you put down your hourly rate, uh, you know, thirty dollars an hour, and <laughs> you're, you're going to starve to death if you work for that rate. Tell you that right now. <laughs> Three fifty. I would be hiring here for him. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, you know, owners. Our marketing thing is, you may pay a little more an hour for us, but we'll design a tighter building that's be cheaper in the long run, and it'll actually we'll save you money. Kind of the idea. Building. Pay us a high fee, but we'll save you more. How does it? How long typically does it take you to design an entire building? Like, let's just say ten floors. Yeah. Ten floors. Yeah. An hour and a half. An hour and a half. Lots of times, uh, designs can vary depending on what you're doing. Uh, we can do a parking structure like the one across the street in about uh, two months. 10 story steel building would probably take somewhere five, six months maybe. To design it? To design it, wow. depending on how complicated it gets. So Parking five, structures are fairly simple. Five, six months times like the weeks, times the hours, eight hours, eight nine. Yeah. Plus the time, yeah. yeah. <laughs> In a 10 story building, you'd have more than one engineer working on it. So with that, what, how many employees should we do? Like six, <laughs> five, two? Well, I don't know. A parking structure, one guy can do it in two months. Two days. All right, continue, right? Okay. <laughs> Luis, is, Luis is figuring out how to get rich, being an interest. <laughs> right? All right. Okay, so uh, let's see. <clears throat> So first thing we want to go promote analysis. So we're going to go to analysis. We're going to go up here to criteria. We've got to look through all this criteria to figure out. So let's look at general first. I'll just kind of walk down. So rigid end zones. This is an elevation of a column and a beam. If you're doing uh, rigid end zones or this, if you have this beam here, and it frames into a column, the stiffness in the area of the column gets very, very high because this thing goes up a floor and down a floor, whereas the beam only has a depth like that. So when we model this, Pretend there's an infinitely stiff piece to the center of the column here. This is the, the end zone. So this lets you choose if you want to assume that this thing doesn't deflect at all. It's totally rigid. And so you have a deflecting shape that might look, you know, if it's <coughs> So you can ignore the effects of the rigid end zone, and usually on steel columns they kind of do. Ignore it on concrete. Uh, it's not infinitely rigid, but you can include the effects here if you have a concrete building. And kind of the standard is to, concrete's not infinitely rigid, so a lot of people put in 50% rigid instead of fully rigid. If you're doing steel, and this building's mostly steel, I would ignore the effects because steel's not as stiff. Uh, the second column member force output at the face of the joint. Uh, you get to design at the face so that we leave that alone. Response spectra analysis, consider sign for analysis results. Uh, that's 
a nice thing to have to figure out which way. It used to be in the old days, response factor, you'd never get a sign. Everything had come out positive, so you'd never know which way it was. The forces were going, positive moment, negative moment. Uh, there's eigenvalue uh, analysis, uh, there's eigenvectors, uh, subspace iteration, and COSOS, I don't know if Dr. Hazelton knows. There's Ritz vectors. Are you, are you familiar with any of those? I'm not. Ritz vectors and what else? I got Ritz vectors, uh, then two different types of eigenvectors. There's just some an different analysis techniques. I don't usually mess with that. Uh, the P delta up on the upper middle right there. Um, Yes. You want to use, unless you want to do all that. Remember that P delta analysis we did in steel? Yes. Yeah, ex yes. Yeah, <laughs> say that like you mean it. <laughs> so we don't want to do that. We want to let the program do at least the P, this is the P big delta analysis. <laughs> so we want to let the program do that. Uh, there's some solver types that you can choose from. We don't really mess with that. Uh, direct analysis method, if you're doing uh, gravity design, uh, remember we did some uh, second order analysis by hand. The, the program will actually do the direct analysis design uh, for columns. Uh, walls, we don't have any walls. Buffing restrain braces, we don't have any of those. So, we could choose direct analysis and use tau sub d as one. Something like that. All right, next criteria is a diaphragm. The default here is rigid. So certainly anything with concrete fills, rigid is probably a good selection. Um, since this building is pretty symmetrical, using rigid on the roof is not going to kill us. Here. So I tend to leave it there. If you want to model semi rigid, you can hit this down arrow. Flexible, non pseudo. And then you're going to have to put in a bunch of parameters. And so, again, with a symmetrical model, um, you're not going to have a real problem with. Uh, forces bouncing around, so I, I tend to leave it as rigid. We don't have any two way decks. Diaphragm mesh, we're not going to be modeling in a bunch of diaphragms. So this is pretty much okay as is. Let's go down to ground level. Uh, if you have a basement uh, and you've modeled it in, you can define your ground level as your first elevator level here. Our ground level is, is at ground, so no big deal there. So we'll leave that at the base. And wind generation, same thing at the base. But if you're modeling in a bunch of basement levels that are underground, you don't have any wind on, on those levels. So uh, this is where you could uh, change that if you need to. You guys won't be reading it again. Uh, redundancy factors. Um, the program doesn't do, since they changed the code, you can't model in the redundancy factors anymore. So you can just leave this alone. You'll have to hand calculate them. That's where if you don't have an, enough bays of frames, the code will make you add 30% to your earthquake forces uh, because you don't have some resiliency there if you lose a bay of frame. If you have two bays of frame and you lose one, you've lost half your lateral system on one side. So uh, the code's going to penalize you for that. What else do we got? Reduced beam section. Uh, this is if you're doing a steel monoframe and you're going to use a uh, 
beams coming into a steel column here. And if you look down on this right here, that's that column looks like this. The beam comes out, the center of the beam is here. And they put this, they call it dog bone. They cut out part of the flange so they're, they're making the plastic hinge form right in this zone here. And they're protecting the connection to the column. And so you guys in your, I don't know, Anybody looked into that yet? There's a number of different ways, uh, methods. The dog bone is one. There's some proprietary things where they've actually done some testing. Um, I blow this beam coming into a column. They found that if they Cut a little slot in here at this connection, and then they weld it up. This little slot relieves a lot of stresses right at that flange there. And they did some testing in this type of system. You have a, a connection plate for shear out here, and you weld up your flanges. And this slot that they stick in there uh, kind of protects this from. Uh, that Northridge earthquake failures where they cracked the flange here and they broke the weld here and stuff. So that's a proprietary thing. If you use that, you have to pay a company for their design. Um, let's see, Simpson has, someone's doing the Simpson strong tie frame, is that right? No, not anymore. Not anymore? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Crushing a little bit. But they have a Mr. Steel uh, number too. Yeah, they have a, a side plate type thing where they put this side plate over there. There's a number of different uh, companies that make connections. So, reduced beam section, buckling restrained. Uh, Star Seismic was bought out by Core Brakes. So, Corbrace now owns Star Seismic. There are two companies that made buckling restraint. Here's side plate. Uh, Yield Link was the Simpson product. Dirt Fuse is another one they've got in there. So Lambs really picked up uh, quite a few of these proprietary systems. All right, so we're not going to worry about any of those at this point. So you want to take a break? Let's do it, and then we'll come back and we'll go through some of the other criteria. Uh,